The Bible is meant to be interpreted literally. However, the Bible uses symbolism, typology, foreshadowing, symbolic parallels, parables, and Jewish idioms to deliver this literal message. Now, once you understand that you are the bride of Christ and that that's your identity and that's who you are, the most compelling evidence for the pre-tribulational rapture is the ancient Jewish wedding. The customs and the details surrounding this entire event paint a complete picture of the pre-tribulational rapture. Now, in the upper room at the Last Supper, the night before Jesus was crucified, Jesus compels Judas to go ahead and do what it is he needs to do. He gets Judas out of the room to go betray him, and immediately Jesus starts speaking to the other eleven as a groom would speak to a bride. This is recorded in John 14, and here we go. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Okay, right here, Jesus is using ancient Jewish marriage customs to explain to the disciples that he was going to be leaving them, that he was going to go away and that he would return and that he would come back to receive them. Jewish bridegrooms would come like a thief in the night because the bride had absolutely no idea exactly when he was coming. The bride must have always been ready because she knew that he could return at any moment. And the groom is absent for an indefinite period of time. Most of the time it was around a year. And he would then return when the place that he was preparing for her was ready. Now, this is immediately the things that would have just automatically been conjured up with the thoughts of the disciples when Jesus starts speaking these words to them. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to go through some of the major points of the ancient Jewish wedding, the rest of them, and see how that they compare to the pre-tribulational rapture. And again, this is the one thing that solidified me for good, for life, forever, that the pre-tribulational rapture is the timing of the rapture and that it is real. Once the groom has picked out his bride, he leaves his father's house and he goes to the bride's house. He offers the bride a marriage covenant. This is a legally binding contract. It is usually in writing and it gives promises to what he plans on doing for the bride should she marry him. The bride can decide to accept or reject this offer. Bread and wine are served. There is a silver chalice which the groom drinks wine. If the bride decides she will accept, he gives her the chalice and she can either drink to accept or decline to drink. And that lets the groom know that he has not been accepted and that there is no wedding covenant. Now, once the bride and groom have both drinking from the wine and she's agreed to marry him, the groom then pays the price for his bride. Once this is done, the groom then departs to his father's house where he goes to build a room addition. It actually becomes the wedding chamber. Now, this normally takes about a year. The groom is absent. And the bride is then set apart. She puts on a veil. She lets other men know that she has already found her love. That she is going to remain faithful to her groom who is absent. 
Now, the father is the one who is in charge of approving this room addition. So even though the groom is at the father's house and he is preparing a place for his bride, the father is the only one who can approve this room addition. So the father is the only one who knows the day and hour that the son is going to be able to return to get his bride. Once the father approves of this room addition, the groom goes back to retrieve his bride. The wedding party has a torchlight procession to the bride's home. This is normally done at night, which is why it's referred to as a torchlight procession. It's normally a surprise event because no one other than the father knew until the son starts going back to retrieve his bride. Along the way, he picks up his groomsmen, and along the way, the bridesmaids, who still have oil in their lamps, help to light the way back to the bride's house. And the groomsmen literally are shouting, Behold, the bridegroom comes to receive his bride. And they blow a shofar, a ram's horn. A, that is the trumpet of their day was the shofar, the ram's horn. So you have the groomsmen with a shout, the groomsmen blowing the trumpet, and the groomsmen get to the bride's house. The bridegroom himself does not go all the way to the house. The bride comes out of the house. The groomsmen then lift the bride in the air above their shoulders and carry her to the groom. Sometimes even done in a, she's even placed in a chair and lifted above their heads and carried to the groom. They get to the groom. They bring her down and give her to the groom. Then the bride and groom go back to the father's house. Once the bride and groom get to the father's house, they enter the wedding chamber alone. They enter into a physical union and they consummate this marriage for seven days. They consummate and celebrate. The other attendees and wedding party wait outside and do their own celebrating for those seven days, waiting for an announcement that a marriage in Israel has happened. The bride and groom then come out of the wedding chamber at the end of the seven days. The groom then removes the bride's veil so that all can clearly see who his bride really is. Then they have the wedding feast for the entire wedding party and invited guests. Once this is complete, that is normally another seven day period, then the bride and groom will live together in their new home forever. Okay, is that cool or what? Uh, right away, you should be noticing all kinds of uh, symbolic parallels, and this should all be very familiar sounding. Uh, to me, this is very, very exciting. But just in case you missed any of the parallels, we're going to go back through this and show exactly how this relates uh, to us and to our wedding with Christ. So here we go. Let's look at it. Jesus leaves his throne in heaven and he actually comes to earth as a human to our home because we are the bride. Jesus offers us an invitation to salvation. At the Last Supper, the disciples accepted his offer by drinking the wine and breaking the bread. Jesus then paid the price for us with his blood on the cross. Jesus then went back to prepare a place for us at the Father's house. While he's gone, we are to be sanctified and to remain faithful to him. We know that only the Father knows the day and hour that the Son will return for us. 
and that Jesus will come again like a thief in the night at an unknown hour. And at the archangel shout and at the trumpet of God, we are to be raptured up to be with Jesus. Jesus takes us into the third heaven where God's throne is. We will be in the wedding chamber in the third heaven for seven years celebrating and consummating and getting our rewards in heaven. Those rewards will be gifts from God to us. After seven years, Jesus shows us off to the world for all to see who his bride really is. Every member of the bride will be known. The wedding supper of the Lamb will then take place on earth at the bride's home with the Old Testament saints. They are the invited guests, as are the tribulation saints, as are the people who survive and make it through in the earthly body through the tribulation period. Then the new Jerusalem will be brought down to the earth where it will be the capital city of the eternal state where we will live forever with Jesus in the new Jerusalem, which you can tell is a gift to the bride. And that is where we will be able to go anywhere but the new Jerusalem will actually be our home and it is what he has prepared for us. Now, unbelievable. I mean, to me, this is hardcore because these are a lot of symbolic parallels. This isn't just one or two little things and you're not just trying to overglaze and make something fit that doesn't fit. Um, because our culture is so much different. Um, a lot of times we miss this and we haven't been taught some of this stuff. But once you know that they understood it, this is one reason why you had disciples like, you know, Peter, John, you had the Apostle Paul, you had Barnabas, you had Titus, you had Timothy. You had all these guys that saw this and had the kind of faith they had, they knew. I mean, there was not even a question. They understood all of this from A to Z. And, you know, it sometimes I think requires a lot more faith on our part because we are having to dig through the scripture to even understand the things that they knew right away. And make no mistake, this is so many parallels. They knew right away. This teaching is absolutely meant to bolster your faith. And as for me, I just can't wait. I am literally looking for the rapture of the church anytime. I'm looking for my groom to come get this bride and to take me where he is to the place he's prepared for me. And I cannot wait. I hope you can either. God bless you all.